Bum, the bum, ba bum, ba da 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 bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba da 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 bum, ba dum, ba dum, ba da 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 bum, da da, ba bum, ba da 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 bum, da da, da 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 bum, di dum, bum bum, ba da da da. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Epic Blunders of Naval History: The Long Patrol, aka the recorded video. And this is still going to be kind of discursive because it comes down to the basic problem whenever you're talking about epic blunders and. Those epic blunders that people wish to talk about. You have to work out, first of all, whether you're going to give your oppo the opponents any agency. Because there are many people who will, events which are described as epic blunders of naval history. Where you really have to look at it and go, well, if side B manages to win against side A, if you consider that automatically an epic blunder by side A, then you're denying any agency to side B. Because if they've just been successful and managed to take apart, take advantage of a weakness of side A and launch an attack and win, woohoo! Why shouldn't they? This is why it's kind of interesting when we talk about the Dutch seizing the English fleet in the Anglo-Dutch Wars. The British have thought the Dutch were defeated. They, the English have you know, presumed the Dutch were defeated, thought they were defeated, thought they'd won, and were trying to save money so they could support the land campaign. Because the King didn't want to do call Parliament and have all the necessities that would need, be needed to fund the war without if he was mobilising the fleet. He put in what he felt was some defence. There was a chain and various other things. Those didn't prove to be enough. But also there's the fact that the Dutch mobilised earlier than normally. They mobilised more quickly. They mobilised a large fleet under a good commander and they managed to steal the strategic surprise off the British. The British got no heads up they were coming at all. If you'd had any warning, any sneaking signal, any information managed to sneak out to the English that the Dutch were on their way, the defences could have been prepared dramatically better. Ships might even be mobilised to act as supports to the forts. And the whole thing could have been very different. So is that an epic blunder by the English? Or is that a successful operation by the Dutch? You could argue it's both, but that's kind of trying to have your cake and eat it. An epic blunder, therefore, in a battle is when a side launches an attack thinking it's the strongest, and based on it being the strongest, expecting an easy win, and loses. For either carelessness or stupidity. Why do I say carelessness or stupidity? Well, I do have a reason for it. I'm not just picking random words. I'm being an academic. Definitions. Ooh. Blunders. Noun, a stupid or careless mistake. Verb, to make a stupid or careless mistake. Act or speak clumsily. Epic, well... In noun terms, it's a long poem and all sorts of things about often some very good epics available, especially some of the Viking sagas are truly epic. Adjective. Relating to or a characteristic of an epic or epics, heroic or grand in scale of character. Well, I don't think we're talking about heroic uh, or grand. We're talking grand in scale, aren't we? So, an epic blunder is a grand, stupid, careless mistake. It's not just a regular blunder, then. It's not just a regular mistake. But it's also got to be a grand, stupid, careless mistake. To be an epic blunder. Hmm. This is going to be interesting. So, then comes the question of where should we start? Where should we start. Well, I'm going to start with uh, with a battle which I've already discussed in a video this year. The Battle of Cape Ecomus. 
possibly one of the largest battles in history, with roughly 330 ships on the Roman side, with 140,000 crew and marines, and 350 ships on the Carthaginian side, with 150,000 crew and marines. The Romans lost 24,000 ships, uh, 24 ships and 10,000 men. The Carthaginians lost 30 ships, 60 sh uh, sunk, 64 ships captured, and between 30 to 40,000 men killed or captured. The point about this fleet, the point about this entire operation, is this. The Romans have been working up their navy quite well. They'd won some victories, they'd managed to do some severe damage to the Carthaginians. And the Carthaginian fleet, main fleet, was off elsewhere, were doing other things. They were short. So, they knew the Romans were coming. They knew the Romans were laying siege to key parts of Sicily. And so, they rushed the fleet together. Their aim was to get the fleet to Sicily, pick up the experienced personnel in Sicily, and then with the experienced personnel, fight the Romans. But the Romans are already laying siege. The Romans are already there. The experienced Roman fleet is already there. This is why I put it down as stupid. You're throwing away ships, you're throwing away men. You're throwing away everything. They send them out to fight. They have to take transports and all sorts of other things with them, which will slow them down. And when they get there, they have a battle. And it's not the battle they want. It's the battle they really, really don't want. Because it ends up with the Carthaginians, A, fighting in line, B, getting divided, and C, a good third of their ships being driven ashore and attacked by the entirety of the Roman Navy, the Roman fleet. It's just not a good scenario. 55 years later, Philip V of Macedon would do something even worse. But it would be a repeat. Again, sending a large, inexperienced fleet versus a smaller, experienced fleet. This time, he'd literally raised his navy two years previously. He'd barely had time to train it up. Macedonia is trying to build itself up. They could have become very strong. They were certainly strong enough that they were being taken. They were being watched by the Romans, etc. At this point, and there was a cruising for a bruising, which would be another war coming up soon between them. But during the Cretan War, which started in 205 BC, the Macedonians and their various allies, um, including the Cretes, Cretans, had had attacked Rhodian ships. Rhodes was the richest merchant fleet in the Aegean at this point. Uh, the navies of Pergamon, Byzantium, and Sisus joined the Rhodian fleet. And these are all experienced fleets. Macedon, Philip V, brings 200 ships with him. He's fighting roughly 100 ships. His ships are inexperienced. They've been raised a couple of years. They've got barely seasoned. And he's attacking. He's making decisions. He's positively deciding when this battle is going to be, what this ground this battle is going to be fought on, because he's attacking. He gets 92 ships sunk. He gets 7 captured. He has 9,000 dead and 2,000 captured. The Allies lose three ships from per Rhodes, three ships from Pergamon, and two ships captured from Pergamon. Rhodes loses 60 dead. Pergamon, 
70 dead. There's a big difference going on there. And I have to say, the Battle of Chios, well, we quickly go back there. Philip was in his own flagship. His own flagship gets knocked out of the battle because it turns the wrong way, smashes into one of his own ships, and then two enemy ships decide to ram her below the waterline, one on each side. So it's rare you actually get a ship sunk in ancient battles. Yes, you ram them, and you especially make a hole below the waterline, but usually the crew can patch things up, and usually it's forced in shallow enough water they can get it ashore and fix it, and it's going to be, t uh, quite often it's taken over by a boarding action. She's held damage, she's damaged enough, she's sunk. And... Well, at this point, Philip has gone off his flagship, gone to another ship, attacks one of the spots, one of the other uh, allied flagships, the uh, Pergamon one, and manages to capture that the, that sh the Pergamon fleet's flagship, trying to convince that fleet, and then tows it back through the uh, through the battle, trying to convince the fleet that that allied king is dead. The Pergamons manage to do sort of withdraw at this point because they think their king's dead, but the rest of the allies keep fighting, and the Macedonians took advantage of the Pergamons withdrawing to withdraw themselves because they are losing. Atalus had actually ex uh, the Pergamon king had actually escaped. Stupid! The battle of Sleis now. So these is one of those battles which, frankly, you sit there and look at and go, Why? So, England mustered between 120 and 150 ships. The French, 213. The British would lose, the English would lose between 400 and 600 and two ships. The French, 16,000 to 20,000, with 190 ships lost, of which 166 were captured. Now, what the French did was they decided the smart thing was to block the Edwards being able to manoeuvre into the harbour. And they decided to block him being able to manoeuvre in the harbour by binding their ships in three lines, forming one large floating pl fighting platform. The English manoeuvred. They, man they could do that because they weren't bound together. They gained the advantage of wind and tide. And thanks to the wind and tide, the French ships were driven to the east of their starting positions and became entangled with each other. So they could move even less. At which point, Boucher and Quirra, the French commanders, ordered the ships to be separated and the fleet attempted to move back to the west against the wind and tide. At this point, the English attack. They were able to basically concentrate the vast majority of their ships versus a very small number of the French ships and just keep repeating and that up the line. Which meant the French lost. Badly. This is a thing. This is an, ep this is an epic blunder. Because you are treating ships like they are a line of fortifications you can put in the, sa in the sea and go, Whoop, we're parked here, we hold this line. You can't do that. Even anchoring them and everything else. You can't do that. It doesn't work. The Battle of Swally. Or Suvali. Now, this is one of those battles which is 
really not supposed to take place. It's between East India Company and Portugal. It's the company victory. The Portuguese bring four galleons and 26 barks. The East India Company bring four galleons. It has an impact in that it sufficiently impresses the uh, Sadar, or governor of Gujarat, that the emperor ends up being more of India, of, well, the Mughal Emperor ends up being more favorable towards the English and the Portuguese because he thinks they're more powerful. Honestly, though, it's not like this battle. It's depicted here. It's a messy thing where neither side really can claim that greater success. At one point, Captain Best in Red Dragon, that's his flagship of the of the, in, in, the East India Company ships, sailed through four Portuguese galleons, during which three of them ran aground, and was joined by Hacienda on the other side. And other ships. They managed, the Portuguese managed to get the three galleons uh, refloated, but honestly, it's a careless battle because the Portuguese should have been or should have organised themselves and should have presumed that well, yes, whilst we have already been here, there's enough riches here to motivate the English, so we need to make sure we are actually organised and capable of doing this. Chesma. Chesma is a battle where nine Russian ships are line with three frigates, a bomb ship, and four fire ships and four supply ships. For loss of one ship at line and four fire ships, managed to take out a force of 16 ships at line, six frigates, six Zebex, 13 galleys, 22 small craft, and 1,300 guns. When I say take out, I mean. They took out 16 ships of line, 6 frigates and escort vessels, 13 galleys, 32 smaller vessels, and at least 11,000 men are killed. Battle of Trafalgar, eat your heart out. Let's be honest, 16 ships taken out by 9 for the loss of 1. <whistles> That's a good performance. By Alexey Orlov, Grigory Spirov, and well, John Elfs uh, Elston. <sighs> Always fun. one of those interesting battles in that the accounts are very mixed. Elston basically claims the Russians were almost useless. But, you know, that might have been good for um, adding on luster to his own position. Possibly. They win but they win mostly by the Ottomans being incredibly stupid in how they manage their force. You know, the Ottomans just keep withdrawing and again keep limiting their own field of manoeuvre. They keep limiting things. The Ottoman main line had roughly 10 ships with 70 to 100 guns between them each. And there's a second line of six of those arranged so they could fire through the gaps in the first line. Again, you're trying to use ships to build forts at sea. Hmm. Just because it is a floating artillery base doesn't mean it is a floating artillery fort. The Battle of Camperdown. Now... This is one of those scenarios where the Dutch can say there was a logical there. You know, it's 15 ships versus 16, and the British have just been through the Normanies and all the Spithead mutinies, all these things going on. Surely 
Their ships must be weakened. That's correct. And the Dutch are very, very good sailors. They're very capable sailors. But the reality is, the Dutch have the most understanding of the sea. They understand that their fleet hasn't been to sea, and whilst politics are pushing it out to sea, they understand it hasn't been at sea and doing the sailing and the stuff it needs to do to be in tip-top shape. Whereas the ships under Admiral Duncan, well, whilst the Spithead Muni and the Muni had been going on, whilst they had been there and had been a usual problem with the British in that they forget to increase the pay of their sailors. It had been over in June. Parker's own HMS Sandwich surrendered on 14th of June. That was the last rebellious ship. And that has an impact. Because if you think about it, what is going to make a fleet more motivated than trying to make sure well, after they, these things have been over, after these munis have been over, everyone starts to pretend, oh no, it wasn't me, I wasn't involved in muni. I'm not, I'm not munis, so I'm well behaved, I'm good, give me my money, please don't forget to pay me. Please, please, please. Don't forget me. Uh, forget to give me my money. Now, the Parker I mentioned there earlier wasn't an admiral. It was Richard Parker who theoretically led the Nor mutineers. Um, I am not quite sure about that. I think Parker was a nice spokesman, in the nicest way. My view is that any mutiny organised on a fleet, it's going to be organised by the NCOs, not by a junior sailor. Not a junior sailor is going to uh, is going to be used. They might be used as a spokesperson, especially by the smart NCOs who don't want to get pegged as a leader and so don't want to uh, be known, so they don't get um prosecuted afterwards. But and find someone who will be suitably impressed and happy to be the front man. But in my experience, and especially in my study of history, it's going to be the merger. It's going to be the NCOs. Now, the thing is, all these ships, all the new ships, me, are over by the 14th of June. It's over. And this battle takes place on the 11th of October, 1797. Takes place on the 11th of October, 1797. The mutiny was over in June. So if you're coming out, relying on the fleet being mutinous and that having wrecked the naval performance of the fleet, well... They've had two weeks in June, plus however many weeks in July, plus August, plus September, and a week of October to be constant at sea and to have got those ships back in fighting trim and order. And especially as most of Duncan's fleet, most of Duncan's fleet didn't go to the Nor, they went to the Spithead sort of area. Which was different. How do I put this? That that was uh, pretty much more respectful, and it was very much a very proper mutiny. It was very much a. I'm sorry, sir. We're not going to be following orders because we haven't been paid, and we're not being paid properly, sir. So if you don't mind, we're going to sail back to port until we're paid properly. I'm very sorry, sir. Hate to disappoint you, sir. 
but I just need to be paid, sir. Which was a very different thing to the Nor mutiny. So, these ships were still very respectful. Now, admittedly, some of the ships in Duncan's fleet never actually rebelled as well. There's his own flagship where he picks up one of the mutineers, dangles him over the side and says, I will sort out your pay, boys. Do you have faith in me? Because do you really want to take my ship off me? Admiral Duncan was a very tall man. For some reason, the sailors all decided that um, they had other things they need to be doing right now. Uh, uh, sailing the ship, for starters, going up in this rigging. All these things need to be done everywhere but anywhere within arm's reach of an aforementioned Scottish Admiral. Uh, we, we're not, we, we, we just don't feel the need to be here right now. Nowhere near here, thank you. It worked. And so then you come out. And again, the Dutch understand things. The Dutch are a naval and maritime culture. Far more than the Spanish or the French, especially during the Revolutionary Wars. And it's kind of like the fleet being ordered out to sea for the Battle of which hasn't been properly trained and drilled together to fight a fleet which is. Oh yes, and they outnumber you. I know it's not going to be an easy battle because you've got good experienced sailors in there, but you're also not exactly giving them an even chance. And the losses. Out of the six, the 15 ships of the line, the Dutch bring with them, or technically the uh, Badavian Republic, under the uh, Republic. Nine ships of the line are captured and two frigates are captured. Out of the 15 ships of the line and six frigates they bring with them. That's a good, a good battle. That's going to make an admiral a mighty rich man. In those periods. Then we have the Rosalie Squadron. If you have ships based in a country and other things based in a country, this is a good lesson for everyone who thinks that forward basing is necessarily the right decision to go in every way and you don't need aircraft carriers, you don't need any of those things, you can just forward base stuff. Well, for long term commitments. This does seem very attractive, but you must remember the fate of the Rosalie Squadron, who, when France ended up at war with Spain, ended up getting captured in their entirety. That's five ships of the line, a frigate, and 4,000 sailors. The losses and casualties on it were 13 dead, 46 wounded, uh, 3,676 captured, and six ships all captured, the Spanish, for this, lost 4 dead, 50 wounded, 15 gunboats sunk, and uh, that's a total of 54 um, people. Oh, well. The Battle of Campeche. The new Battle of Campeche is probably one of the more interesting ones, because... The Mexican Navy sends the Guadalupe and the Montezuma to engage a squadron of vessels from the Republic of Yucatan and the Republic of Texas. Pretty much Texas force was built around the sloop of war, pictured here, the Austin. Commanded by Cottermordor Edwin Ward Moore, who was technically, well, let's put it this way, the president of Texas was not happy he deployed, and was actually pretty much planning on charging with piracy until it comes back and he won. In which case he got fated as a hero. It's always a good way to do it, run things. In fact, the scene from this battle is engraved on, engraved on the cylinder of every Colt 1851 Navy pattern. 1860 Army and 1861 Navy Revolver as well. I do worry about that. We'll leave that to one side. Basically, the Mexican ships should have won. You have three steamers, two brigs, and two schooners on one side. 
a sloop of war, a brig, two schooners, and five gunboats on the other side. What happens? What's even more interesting is that the Guadalupe and the Matsuzuma were not only each armed with two 68-pound Paxians guns, able to fire exploding shells, they were commanded by British officers and crewed by British and Mexican sailors. The battle turns into a draw, though. Both sides again withdrawing after sustaining considerable damage and casualties. And it was due to this damage that Guadalupe and Montezuma and Regenerator, another vessel which wasn't there for the second battle, withdrew from the area. Because with the damage sustained, they couldn't support themselves anymore in the area. Again, it's the whole surface radar glass draw scenario writ large. You don't need to win the battle, you just need to do enough damage, they need to go and repair themselves. And, oh my, your blockade is over. I have won. Ah, the Battle of Tashima. Okay. So here is the thing. You've already lost your squadron. In the Far East. You have no supporting bases where this squadron can rearm, repair itself, or anything before it goes into battle. So your plan is to deploy it all the way around the world and then it fight a battle. In human terms, that is like making someone run a full marathon, then have to do a 100 meter, 100 meter sprint and finish in the top three of that race and then go 12 rounds in a boxing match against a fresh boxer who hasn't had uh, someone who hasn't had to do any of that what are the odds you survive let's see what would the odds that anyone would win in that scenario not high. Well, for surprising enough, it's the same for a fleet. When you're asked them to do this, it's not high. The fact that they actually get out there at all is a feat which means Rodetsky should be given great praise. Great praise indeed. But, he does well. He gets his fleet out there. That's a Great a feat, but he should never have been sent in the first place. He should never have been sent. And you can point out and go, well, in the age of sail, they'd have sent a fleet that far. You look, the British didn't. The British and the French didn't. And the whole point about Age of Sail was a sailing ship can pull up pretty much any protected bay where it can find wood and fresh water and repair itself. That's the point. With the stores, of saw, uh, stores aboard, it can pretty much repair itself and get itself back into full fighting trim. These ships can't. Not without a port, not without, a port, not without base facilities. To make this work, you needed the Franco-Russian alliance to come into play, and you needed the Russians to be able to stop in the French Indochina, rearm, repair, rebuild themselves there, and then surge up. But that's not going to happen. You needed the fleet to be able to do something like, instead of sailing up the coast of China, or sailing up the coast through the South China Sea, etc., to actually go into the Pacific and sail up. 
There is an interesting question which someone once put to me, which was, if the Panama Canal had been a viable route for them to go, could the Russians have done it? And there is an interesting idea there, because if the Russians did hug the American coast up, and because if the Panama Canal is completed in time, and come down from the north, there is a theoretical, so instead of going past Japan to get to their bases, they reach their own Russian bases, not the good ones, but some of the really high northern ones, and for places, first, pick up supplies, get rid of people who are proving difficult, fix up ships and then move down from there, could it work? I don't know. Considering how Rodetsky had actually managed to get the fleet there in the first place, I wouldn't put it past him. He's a good admiral. But I don't think he wins. Because that fleet is just too battered by that time of that journey. It would, to get it ready for action would take weeks. You know, the, especially in those north, more northerly ports. Again, this is why French into China makes sense. So, it, The whole point is, it shouldn't have been sent. It's an epic blunder because you are losing your whole fleet based on a, re a reasoning of ego without thinking through the strategic and logical scenarios of sending it. Darnell's campaign. It's stupid. Why? Because anyone with a basic reading of history knows you don't tell the enemy you're coming. You don't launch an attack and then finish it off halfway because you suddenly worry about the damage you're taking. And you don't suddenly go away and then come back and go away and come back. You needed to approach it logically from the beginning. You could do. You could do the Darnells. You could have forced it successfully. If you'd taken some merchant ships and loaded them with explosives and set them off in the minefields as a sort of Monday fire ship, that might have helped clear some mines. If you had taken some pre dreadnoughts and you had fitted humongous bulges to them and filled up space inside them, forward, uh, forward compartments that you don't need to use, with cork and maybe put skeleton crews on them, just enough to fire their guns and keep their engines going, and then pushed your way through, you could have done it. But as you do Darnell's campaign is run, it's a stupid, epic blunder. It's not based on the... Let's put it this way. The Ottomans are capable of learning, and they do produce some very efficient, very good fighting forces. But the whole campaign could have been won at the beginning when the Ottomans weren't prepared. Because the Ottomans weren't prepared, because they weren't expecting anyone to come and attack them. Also, they'd been the sick man of Europe for so long, they were really not ready for it. Let me have Moon Sound. Moon Sound, the Germans shouldn't have lost anything. They have such an overwhelming superiority of strength because their construction progress has been going on and the Russians still haven't properly recovered from the Battle of Toshima. That there should be no chance for the Russians to be mauling German ships. There should be no chance for the Russians to be actually holding them up. Yeah, they do. Because ego means they don't send in enough ships. It's always fun when that happens. Interwar period. Well, I could have talked about some of the ship design from previous. I could have talked about the captain and all that. But I consider the captain a blunder. But is it really an epic blunder? Not really. But there are some things which are blunders. For pretty much everyone in the interwar period makes a lot of them. The naval treaties, are they epic blunders? <sighs> some of the wording certainly is for some of them part of the I'm not sure I'd call them all epic blunders. 
I'd say if there is a problem, and this one is, which is a plunder, is that trying to keep it going with the 1922 Washington Treaty and the 1930 London Treaty, that's fine. The 1936 London Treaty should have been let to die. The moment the Japanese decided they weren't part of it, it was over as a system. And it should have freed up construction immediately. The fact it doesn't is down to the various governments. I'd add in that this vessel is a good example of some of the issues you have going on. Now, this is built as a pre-dreadnought standard. It's usually, I consider, a heavy cruiser. Why? Because it is a heavy cruiser. But a heavy cruiser armed with 11 inch gun, by treaty standards, not reality. But a, treaty, a heavy cruiser armed with 6 11 inch guns. Which doesn't really make sense. Now, there are two ways you could have done to fix this. You could have made it an all forward arrangement, like Nelson and Rodney, which were already in service, and Dunkirk's. Now, that would have been interesting. All the 11 inch guns forward. The engines and secondary armament aft, along with the aircraft, would certainly have produced a very interesting and very capable ship. You could have probably done that under the tonnage allowance. You could also push the tonnage allowance completely, because you're already cheating and lying over it, so lie actually properly, and this is a big problem the treaties for everyone, because if you're going to lie, actually lie worthwhile. You know, it's one of the things I do appreciate about the Rage of Marina. When they lie, they actually lie properly. They don't go, we're going to get away with a little bit here. No, they go, full hog, we are going to claim this is this, and everyone's going to know we're not, because, but no one wants to start a war, so no one's going to call us on it. In that, build this ship with nine 11-inch guns. Make it a sort of proto Scharnhorst Nisenau. Nice and get a lot of them. Not just three. But six, twelve even. And the reason I'm saying this is because, yes, there are limitations, but it's anyway, if you just keep ordering them one at a time, then people have the chance to say, no, don't order more, or to just ignore it because it's only another one and you've already got one. And that would allow you to build up a very strong fleet and actually build up your infrastructure. And the big problem for the uh, for the Germans with actually their fleet operations for a lot of World War II is infrastructure. Because it's not just having the ships and being able to build the ships. It's the availability of the ships after you have them because they need to be repaired. Look at how long Scharnhorst and Neisenau have to spend in dry, various dry docks to be fixed up and repaired at various points. It's just it's the lack of infrastructure. And these ships could have been used to build infrastructure. There are lots of things which should have been studied and should have been fought out in the interwar period. You have to remember the strategic considerations were, one, war will never happen again because World War I was so horrific. We have suffered so much in this war, we will never do another war like it. it was a real raison d'etre of much of strong belief. And two, and this is something which cannot be overlooked, there was a desire to save money and spend that money on growing the economy. They're not necessarily bad things. But defence spending can actually help. It's one of the few areas of government spending, rather like education, infrastructure and healthcare, which can actually help grow the economy. Police, etc., they are necessary to keep the economy stable, to keep it politically stable, to make it safe to operate and safe to function. Healthcare, how can that grow the economy? Well, because if you're investing in healthcare, you tend to invest in companies and products and developments and science which then get sold around the, elsewhere around the world. Also, people who have good access to healthcare tend to live longer, tend to live happier, be happier. And therefore, if they have health care, they also tend to have more kids. That's the theory. Definitely, the kids they have, it's safe for them to have them. 
and those kids are more likely to grow up and those people are more likely to live longer and that means you have the experience around longer because the longer someone's around the more chance they build up institutional memory and the more chance they pass it on all of which are things which help grow economies education helps grow an economy through rather similar things it's one of those interesting things that people often focus on stem science technology education uh, engineering and maths as these sort of things which grow the economy but for those to be successful you need communication skills and that is the other thing education is good at teaching communication skills research skills and the basic skills with the science the technology the engineering and maths to allow people to pursue those things that is an important part of it, part of education defense well again you're in de you're investing in industry because you're building stuff especially if you're building a ship you're buying pretty much everything you're buying toilets you're buying this you're buying that you're buying everything and you can provide some consistent employment in areas through a down period and you're also again investing in research and science and, uh, and science and engineering which can be sold to other people so you need those things and those things are sensible to invest in infrastructure of course well that grows the economy by very simply for things of making it easier for the economy to interact and also by the way these things can all be done in a way which is how do i put this politely sensible from an environmental management perspective please note i use the phrase environmental management perspective uh, and that's part of it from looking at the uh, looking at the, the sort of scenarios people often think of going from one side or another side in sort of the terms of debates they go oh we shouldn't worry about this we should concentrate just on the economy or we should concentrate just on the environment above all else and actually need to manage both those things and you need to sort of manage it and work and make sure it works together because if you go too far one way you're going to upset enough people they're going to stop listening to you and it's going to shift back and counterbalance the other way either way if you go either direction so you need to manage it and keep it roughly in the area which people are happy to accept it's a complicated navigation course and requires political skill to navigate it so let's go to the battle of denmark straits everyone's favorite epic blunder of world war two but is it is it a grand stupid or careless mistake HMS Hood hadn't been upgraded and refitted yet. That might have stopped the golden shell from hitting where it hit. I do ascribe to the Drakenau theory of how, where the shell hit and how it hit. I doubt it would have made much of a difference if she'd been upgraded. It would have been good for her to have been upgraded and refitted. But the trouble is that would require you upgrading and refitting more ships uh, prior to war beginning. And the whole point is, the British think they have to at least 1942. That's what our Navy's operating on, and that's what their budget really reflects. There's usually the point then people are like, well, they're spending more money on the Air Force than they are on the Navy and the Army. Well, that's because the Air Force is having to build stuff up from scratch, because they don't have the infrastructure. Whereas the Navy and the Army are mostly reactivating existing infrastructure, which tends to be cheaper. So that was the, that's the cost differential. Okay, should you have sent Prince of Wales and Hood to against Bismarck and Prince Oregon? Well, you have to remember that's not the only task group out there. There's also King George V and Victorious, which is an aircraft carrier. So let's see. Would you leave your only aircraft carrier with Hood as its escort? Well, the trouble is Hood is a battle cruiser. So one-on-one -on -one versus Bismarck might not turn out that well. And also, again, the aircraft carrier is going to be one of the primary reconnaissance and information gathering tools you ha the commander has. So he's going to want to be with her. So he's in King George V. Okay, 
let's say he does the other one. Let's say it's King George V and Hood going off as part as the pair, and Prince of Wales stays with Victorious. Well, then you've left your aircraft carrier with your capital ship, which is working up and is newest and has the most issues because it is going through working up. That doesn't sound that sensible either. You need to form two hunting groups because whilst you've got crews out there scouting and searching for it, you've got to have these, you've got to cover the space of the ocean. And if you form up in just one block, which might be sensible, that means you can only be in one spot to respond and it's going to take you longer to reach them. And the whole point of this is to have forces mobilized so they can quickly reach, intercept, and engage, engage and destroy the Prince, uh, the Bismarck and the Prince Jürgen. So in the end, you end up matching up your oldest ship and King George V stays with the carrier. So you have two reliable capital ships. One theoretically reliable capital ship. And that's how you organize things. Then life happens. Hood gets hit. Hood gets hit. Ouch. No one wants that to happen. But they're also... They're not doing an epic blunder. They've done a sensible operation. A sensible commitment. There is also a realisation here. You have to go back again to that decision earlier in the war. When Churchill was in the, uh, was, became First Sea Lord, First Lord of the Admiralty, and... Not First Sea Lord, First Lord of the Admiralty. Apologies. And, beca and caused the pause of capital ship and carrier construction to focus on escorts. Yes, that did surge out the escorts. Allowed you a higher pace of escort production once you'd shifted and retrained the people across under construction. But that paused your carriers and paused your capital ships. Now, what would have been the impact if he hadn't done this? Well, Denmark Strait takes place 1941, roughly two years later. There is probably at least another one, if not two, carriers in service at the time of Denmark Strait, if that hasn't happened. There is probably, well, Prince of Wales probably came in, would have come into service earlier. Duke of York could have been in service earlier. And you might well have fixed their problems. In which case, this force might have had three King George V's with it, and Hood might have been able to go into the refit. And there could have been two armoured carriers with it. Or Hood could have been there as well, but it could have been Hood with King George uh, Hood and a carrier with Prince of Wales, and, well, probably actually be Hood, carrier... And King and Prince of Wales, yes, because that would have been second in service. King and King George V, victorious, and Duke of York. And those would be your two hunt, your two hunting forces, your two groups. Each would be have a carrier. Each would have a pair of capital ships. So it all goes back to that decision. Now, do we consider that decision an epic blunder? No, it's not an epic blunder. I'd say it's an annoying blunder. I'd say it's a strategic mistake. And I'd say that's more a case on the carrier construction than the capital ship construction. I would say keep the you've got a good argument to keep the carriers going. You've only got hindsight to keep the capital ships going. But you've got a good argument to keep the carriers going because their role in anti-submarine warfare and convoy protection and commerce protect and commerce protection. So you should have kept the carriers going. And then even if you'd had a second another carrier there. Well, if Prince of Wales and Hood have a carrier with them, then 
What does Harlan do? Well, he probably flies off a carrier strike as soon as he can to hit Bismarck. And so Bismarck might well have already been hit by torpedoes before they even engage. Now, think about that. If Bismarck is slowed down by a torpedo strike from the carrier with Holland, and then they have the signal, they have the data, they have the tracking information, another strike can come, probably fly in from Victorious. Well, if you had a, you've had strikes coming in from aircraft and Bismarck and Prince Eugen are damaged, or even if they're keeping going, but they're, they've been hit or any, in any way, shape or form, you have that advantage over them. And that changes how you act. So it's very much, it's a product of the resources available at the time to do the mission that's needed. Not an epic blunder. It's not a stupid or careless mistake. It's a, uh, this is what we have, this is what we'll do. We know what we're doing is not necessarily the best course of action, but it's the best course of action we can achieve. However, there are some stupid and careless mistakes in World War II. Some massively ones. Yamato. If you are going to build a ship which is all built around being the biggest and best and grandest battleship ever built, nine 18 inch guns, f the most weight, fast, powerful, it only works to, as a deterrence if people know about it. Okay? It's, it's, it's like if you have a security system on your home and you don't have any signs up which say this house is alarmed or this house has security cameras. Why? Yes, you've got the system. But the whole point of it is to be a deterrent. If people don't know you've got the system, it can't deter anyone. It just looks pretty when they're doing it. And the point about these sort of systems and these sort of facts and figures, if you're building the biggest, if you're building the largest, most powerful, the best ship, then you're sort of copying the hood mantra from the Empire Cruise when the British went off and showed it around the world. And the whole reason for the British taking hood around the world, because it, they left the Americans the idea that hood was fantabulous and really, really scary. It left everyone with the idea the British had this really powerful ship in the 1920s. And that's the image which then you have going into World War II when the world has moved on and changed a bit. But the point is, that's how you do deterrence with something which is big and powerful. And what would that have done? Well, if you announce that and then Roosevelt, what does he do? Well, he's got these standard battleships, but the Japanese are announcing. And here's the thing the Japanese can announce. We are building four. Two will be in service soon, two more to follow after that, very shortly. You know, lie shamelessly. And suddenly the Americans have got to sit there and think, oh, well, hang on, can the South Dakotas take these on? No. Because they've got 60-inch guns. And the, the US Navy's probably going, yeah, they can take them on, but the politicians are going, you sure? You turned down 18-inch guns. That thing's got as many 18-inch guns as you got 16-inch guns. And the standards have got no chance with their guns. No chance at all. You're going to force the British and the Americans into a dilemma. They're going to have to decide, do we complete the building programs we're doing? Do we pause and redesign the construction work we're doing? Do we delete the construction we're doing, stop it, and start anew? Because we have to suddenly build something to match that. And while they're worrying over that, you buy time for you to build up the infrastructure and other things you need to do the operations which, will which could come in World War II when you start fighting them. You could well force the Americans back. Or force the Americans to actually do something stupid. That's the thing. Attacking Pearl Harbor and not launching the final strike and all those things, that can be considered stupid because it isn't going to lead to a can't I, I can't uh, you know to a decisive battle to Kantai Kessen or anything like that. Again, I've done videos on those topics. But it is going to lead to the Americans coming back. Whereas announcing this well, that might force the Americans to actually attack you first, out of fear. 
Or, alternatively, it will force the Americans to suddenly panic about all their ships and all their positions, and they might withdraw from some of their forward bases or until they can reinforce them properly. Either way, it's going to make them change what they're thinking. I'm going to get to Pearl Harbor. If you are going to forward base your fleet, you need to make sure, A, the commander gets the information they need, B, i.e. all the intelligence data you have, and accurate intelligence data, B, you need to make sure that fleet, that area is properly defended, in air defense wise, and protected in, against attack, uh, surface attacks and all those things, preferably before the fleet gets there, and is properly, C, is properly supplied, so they can exercise and operate and do all the things they need to do. It needs all those things. If you don't, you end up with this. That is what happens. Four basing is a great idea. As long as you do it properly. It's like everything in defense and security. These things are always a good idea as long as you do them properly. However, it's only after World War II that we get some really fun things coming in terms of ship design and force structure. We're going to build an aircraft carrier that's not actually a full aircraft carrier. It's a through deck cruiser. Because we have to call it that. Because otherwise, the treasury will get upset with us. Because we're spending money. We're going to build ships without four and a half inch guns or deck guns of any kind because it's the missile age. And of course, the idea that we might run out of missiles in a combat doesn't matter because, well, reality is we believe that it's always going to be a nuclear war straight away. And here is the big problem with that. And this is the problem which has actually caused a lot of people to reevaluate it once they started thinking about it in the 1970s and 80s. The big problem with presuming any major war goes immediately nuclear or goes quickly nuclear is the experience of World War II. When the sides who had a balance of strategic weaponry didn't use that weaponry for fear of the other side's retaliation. What am I talking about? Biological and chemical weapons. They predate they predate nuclear weapons. In fact, biological and chemical weapons have been around for a very long time. And they're very scary and very nasty things. Well, Britain and Germany have the largest stockpiles of each at the beginning of World War II. And at no point do they use them on each other. Why? Even when it would have made sense, defending, defending the retreat to Dunkirk and all those things, you don't deploy them. Because of... The risk of the other side using theirs on you. So the entire war, the invasion of Germany, even Hitler, when he's being invaded by Russia and, G and the Allies, doesn't deploy them because they'll come back at him. That's the fear, that's the reasoning. You don't do use these things because they'll come back at you. I don't know. No one knows with any distributed weapons when you're dealing with opponents who launch wars of aggression. If you launch a war of aggression, it's rarely, if ever, a logical act and definitely not a rational one. But, and I'd say this is a with a big caveat, but as a whole... People who have the egos to do such things don't want to fall back on such messy means as strategic weaponry to secure their goals. Because whilst it might be a good way of saying, well, if I can't have it, no one can, they are also tend to be quite control freaks, very obsessed with controlling personalities, and the moment you use those weapons, you, the scenario no longer has any levers of control over it. You use those weapons, you've opened up the other side's ability to use those weapons as well. Any weapon they want to use, they can use. That's a problem for you. That's something you don't want to be in. So that means you have to think this through. Because if you use it, you lose control. Falklands War is careless. The Falklands War should not have happened. We can go to the CVA-1 decision. Yeah. 
We could also say that the Invincible class needed to be a little bit bigger, so it looked a little bit more like proper, proper carriers. I'm talking five, six thousand tons more. A little bit bigger. Just a little bit bigger. And they might have looked more impressive and might have done, and might have provided the sort of protect, necessary security and protection. We'll never know. But, and the British forces definitely need airborne, needed airborne early warning. But leaving that all to one side, the thing about the Falcons War and the really thing that's careless is that it happens because of the mixed signals going on. All those lives are lost because the Argentine junta believes that they are le going to get less resistance attacking the Falklands and they're going to get an easier win and an easier victory, an easier luster for their gold braid and their status to secure themselves at home than if they do launch another war against Chile. They thought fighting Britain was e going to be easier than fighting Chile. Britain, which was one of the major powers in NATO at this point, still is one of the major powers today, one of the major powers in the world, it would pride itself as, a member of the United Nations Security Council, was evaluated as being weaker and easier to fight by Argentina than Chile. Now, is that Chile's mistake? Argentina's mistake? And when I say Chile's mistake, I mean, you know, have they managed? Have they spent so much on defence rather than anything else that they're now now their entire force and nation is pretty much one giant hedgehog of weaponry? Argentina's mistake or Britain's mistake? I'd argue it's Britain's mistake because Britain's sending out the missed signals, and Britain's building the ships which are orientated around fighting one kind of war—a short North Atlantic war again before the war turns nuclear. That's why they don't have guns. Because you only need guns in a scenario where you're thinking about having to fight for long enough to actually have to reload. Because you're going to run out of missiles very quickly. If you don't think you're going to have to do more than, one, uh, more than fill up the ships once or twice, it doesn't matter. You only have guns on there when you start to think, well, hang on, what are we going to, have to, what are we going to fill these ships up with the, sec the first, second time they come back to harbour? Because we can't build missiles fast enough. We don't have the facilities. I was talking in one of the videos, I think it was the uh, the Brooklyn class common response, and I was talking about air defense and seeing how it's changed. In World War II, it was break out of defense, the fighters break up the attack into flights. From strikes to flights, may preferably smaller, but minimum break it up into a flight. Then the heavy artillery, the five inch, the four and a half inch, the five point two fives, break those flights up into single plane, uh, single groups of air, single aircraft, basically ones, maybe maximum twos, but preferably ones of aircraft. And then it's the forty millimeters, which are driving the aircraft off the ships, or or knocking them out of the sky. And you have that fa that sort of those phases that it goes through. Modern air defense is not like that. The fighters are supposed to shoot things down and hopefully also break up a strike. Then the area defense missiles are supposed to sh shoot things down. And then the point defense missiles are supposed to shoot things down. And then the CIWS is supposed to shoot things down. Everything is built around shooting the enemy down, which is supposed to be the most efficient and best use of your resources. But at a certain point, there is a problem. Because once you run out of missiles for the area air defense, which are going to be your largest air defense missiles, it's not going to be long before you run out of missiles for your point defense. And then you're going to be left with a close-in weapon system and your missiles for your fighters, which are probably going to be your largest stockpile of, fight of missiles. Because again, they're smaller and it's easier to rearm the aircraft carrier at sea and reload that than it is to reload VLS. I know their Americans are currently planning, experimenting around with various things, but let's be honest, that's a forward operating base scenario. That is not replenishment at sea in terms of using that sort of crane system. So this is the reality we have going on. 
very quickly, I would think, in any kind of long-term conflict, high power, between high-powered conflict in the future, between multiple alliances, you would have it go back to have to go back to a World War Two stylish scenario, because we can build shells far more quickly than we can missiles. Even to this day. Although, there again, we don't have exactly that many production facilities for shells. We really don't. Will we ever learn? Well, that's the whole point of an epic blunder. The point is, you make it usually through ego and conceit. You cannot learn... Well, how do I put this? Some of the most educated people I've met are also some of the most stupid. Let me explain. Let me explain. I have friends who can speak a dozen languages. They're also the same friends who will walk down dark alleys in the centre of London late at night or very early hours of the morning on their phone, talking away with their wallet in their hand. I know, because I once walked down a valley, with a, uh, down uh, such an alley, with a couple of them doing that. And I was sitting there going, I'm tempted to rob you guys, just to make the point, let alone anyone else who could be here watching you. They were so confident, they were just so confident, because in their world, no one would ever do anything to them. No one would, that would never happen. Because of who they are, of their knowledge, their anything, they're, they're, they're so smart, that just wouldn't happen. Apologies for that one. That is a problem. That is when you run into trouble. If you believe nothing will ever happen to you, you make the biggest mistakes and the biggest blunders. And then you have the policy we've had in recent years. When the Cold War was over and suddenly the world was going to be wars of choice. And you end up building just two aircraft carriers because we're going to choose when we go to war. And we're going to let only have minimal aircraft for those carriers. The US, we're going to load up... Instead of being sensible with our new carrier, we're not going to and trying to future proof it by testing some of these systems out on refits of the older ships when they come in before we implement them on a new ship. And so the new ship doesn't come in with everything on it in one go. We're going to put everything on it. The Russians. Well, we are. We're so strong, you know. Do we really need to spend this money on? Are refitting our ship, or shall we have another Desha, uh, and maybe a maybe a villa in the south of France? Be wary of people telling you they have control of, or they have solved, or have control of one of three things: one, the global economy; two, the likelihood of war; and three. And this is the most important one. If they ever tell you that they have absolute control of themselves. No one has absolute control of themselves. You don't. You can't... 
you have can exercise as much control as you like, but you always give up a certain level of control of yourself to the world around you. I have decided to sit in this seat. But the position and the way I'm sitting in this seat is decided for me to an extent by the shape of a room, which I have built. And what looks comfortable on the camera, and what works with the camera. I would really like to have not burped a couple of times in this recording video today, but I'll probably leave them in because it actually helps me make my point. Yes, I have been drinking fizzy drink again, and yes, mm, it's probably because I haven't had enough food to eat. And so, the gas leads to embarrassment of burping. But sometimes I get it even when I have eaten. And I actually have been eating. But it was chocolate rather than malt loaf, so that probably explains why it was less effective at making sure that I didn't start burping with all the iron brew. We live and we learn. The reason I didn't have malt loaf? Well, surely I can control what goes into my system. Well, in that case. I ordered it from the co-op, it didn't arrive, they were sold out. Let's take this back to the economy. Why can you not have absolute control of the economy? Because it depends on so many other people's psychology. It depends on people's perspectives. And you can't have absolute control over them because they don't have absolute control over themselves. So that means there's going to be a lot of the same with war and both the economy and war you can order something but it might not arrive on time or it might not arrive at all think about that the Royal Navy ordered a fighter in 1938 it was being built and designed in 1939 it was cancelled in 1939 to focus on the war in Europe if that fighter had been built, let's say it's the Seafire, which is the gull-winged air aircraft which the um, Supermarine were working on, it would have been in service by 1941 in the Mediterranean and other points fought up with the Royal Navy. How does that change? How does having a high-performance single-seat fighter change the Royal Navy is experience in World War II in the Mediterranean? We won't ever know. Not in 1941. We don't know until eventually they get wildcats there. We don't know. Even the hurricanes they get there are the older versions of the hurricane. We don't know. They planned for it. They'd ordered it. It didn't arrive. We talk about the Zumwalt class. They are a great example of a ship which is planned for a whole load of technologies, and when the technologies don't arrive, the Zumwalt class get blamed for it. But it was not the Zumwalt's fault. It's Rumsfeld's fault. It's lots of people's fault, but it's not the Zumwalt's fault. Those are a good ship design. And in many ways, it would be sensible to build those ships as, we are designing these ships to take these technologies when they come into service, but in the meantime, they're going to be fitted with this, this, and this. And then kept, kept building them. Because then you'd have had a new class of destroyer in the service, which would allow the US Navy to look very strong at the moment. And that would have been useful. And then the US Navy could have claimed that program as a success. But instead, they made the decision, and the various departments of defense, etc., made the decision to tr put all the new technologies to present these ships as going to be revolutionary ships with all this new technology aboard. And when it wasn't ready in time, the ship gets the blame, the program gets the blame, when it's not the program's fault. 
It's not the ship's fault. It's not the design's fault. It's the people who decided that they were going to pick unready technologies to go fit on it. And so if you go to war, you don't have the winning capable ship you could have had. You certainly don't have the ship you were talking about having. You instead have nothing. Oh well. I'm going to go and redress my own blunder of today and actually get some proper food. It's becoming about time. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and thank you again for all your support. Without it, wouldn't be achieving anything like what I'm achieving research-wise. So thank you very much for that. Take care, and have a nice day. Oh, before I go, epic blunders. <laughs> yeah, I waited a little bit long before coming back and saying this. But no, question. Now, normally, I have to say with this topic, I'd be tempted to leave it and just let you all put in whatever epic blunders you think are there. But I was going to change the question around. I'd like people to comment, with, if you wouldn't mind, if you have time and interested, in what you think is often portrayed as being an epic blunder, but which actually is the other flip side of the coin. It's just the enemy did really well. It's not one side being uh, doing an epic blunder. It's the other side actually succeeding in their job and actually winning through them being very good. It's a positive thing for them rather than a negative thing for... It's a positive for side B rather than a negative for side A. I'd be really interested to hear what people think of that. Anyway, thank you very much, take care, and hope you enjoyed.